Oops, I signed in as the Odyssey. <laughs> hey there. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry, I signed in as the wrong account. Let me sign out and come back in. I'm in as the Odyssey for some reason. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody excited to learn some MLA or to refresh some MLA? Teach me. <laughs> I shall do my best. It's us. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Hi, Nancy. How are you today? Good. I love our uh, sweater. Oh, Chris, you didn't get your sweater yet. Oh, no. No, I guess, was it sent down to South Lake? I haven't been uh, at the campus for a bit. I'll probably bring it, if I didn't bring it down yet, I'll bring it down next week and drop it off at the library. Cool. I can always use yeah. another comfy shirt. I know. That, well, this one's nice and warm. I think it's why everybody's wearing it because officers are so cold here today. It's, it's, it's just been damp this year, like just cold and damp. Gets into the bones. Well, it's into my bones. I just keep drinking more and more coffee, which is probably not good for me because I've had way too much caffeine. Yes. It's warm. Yeah. I'm full of caffeine currently. I'm, I'm working from home today, so. <laughs> Kevin and I, I are ready. Yes. We hard on this yesterday. <laughs> we did. We're ready. I created that slide we talked about for the MLA nine changes, so I've got that to pop up. Cool. We got yeah, our. And we I got, got our... your notes. Thank you for those changes. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, we got a handout. We got libguide. We are good to go. Mm -hmm. Cool. And yesterday it timed out really well. So yeah, it was great. It was like right on. And we were, I was impressed. I yeah, I looked at, I need about 25 minutes. So if I'm not, I should be done at 25. So if I'm not done by what, 10 after, mm -hmm. then send me a, a personal message, Kristen. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. I need to talk. <laughs> I'll wave at you. Yeah. Hi. At 10 after everybody goes, stop. <laughs> we'll keep you there. Don't worry. Hmm. Also, if I forget to switch my screen share, which is something I tend to do. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> I do it too. So I'll try to be mindful as well. <laughs> yeah, this will hmm. be fun. Everybody loves MLA. <laughs> I just love the LibGuide. It's so much easier. Me too. That's my favorite thing. It's something that I reference so frequently. It's, as you kept saying yesterday when we were talking about this, you know, we don't need to memorize it. There's no reason to memorize this. You do memorize parts of it working with it all the time like we do, but it's, there are still things I even have to go look up. Uh, Shakespeare sometimes throws me. So I have to go, you know, actually dig up the anthology or the Shakespeare or the Bible. The Bible one is also a little weird, so. Cool. So I have a student who applied for my SOAR student orientation program. And he said that uh, you work with him, Kevin, and his presentation is about the library. So it was so awesome. He did uh, he did a good job in putting together um, a PowerPoint. So oh, yeah. You know him? I oh do. My is that Stephen Brocher? Yes, actually. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. Sword. He's my SOAR leader right now, and he's just racking it all. So he's a representative of our SOAR program, which is actually tomorrow. So every time that I ask him, he's always uh, sharing the uh, information about the library. So thank you for helping <laughs> him. It was a nice PowerPoint that he put together for you guys. I'm so excited. Uh, he didn't actually show me the PowerPoint, but he asked me a lot of questions. So yeah. I tried to give him you know, the best information that I had that I thought would be useful to our incoming students. So I'm he really does. happy to hear he did a good job. And he, we also hired him as a worker in our department. <laughs> Amazing. So he's just uh, uh, racking it all. <laughs> he, is, he is fantastic. So uh, I'm working with him as part of the honors program. Um, I'm helping him with his capstone project. So we've been working a bit together off and on for, I don't know, about eight or nine months now. He's an exceptional student. Wow. Yeah, I will be missing him because he's graduating this spring, but I'm happy yeah. for his, uh, you know, yeah, his uh, new awesome. adventure after Lake Sumter. <laughs> that's right. And that's what we want for them. We want them to go on and have a new adventure and, and learn new things, you know. And we're always sad to see them go, mind you, because I know when my students graduated in December, I was very sad. They'd been with me for the last couple of years. But uh, we get new ones and we get new experiences. So it's always, it's always nice to see. Yep. 
and then they will come back and they will say thank you for all your uh, information help for me so that's the beauty of that right i agree, I agree. that that makes it worthwhile yeah but thank you for helping yeah. them of course anytime he's great all right is the library now open for the term uh technically we're open yeah uh, nine to four but we're there's really been nobody here we ha i have one student in here doing SOAR right now actually she's doing her online portion she's in the classroom but um we're kind of in a flux some of our furniture isn't here yet so we don't have our computers out on the floor like we did oh. uh, i'm having to route those people that need computer access to the classroom in the back of the building but um yeah we're open just i don't expect to see many people probably until the end of the week or the very beginning of next week and then we're officially open for the semester and they moved the vaccinations, right? They did, yeah, because what a mess that turned out to be. Yeah, I can I can bet. It, yeah, I guess it, when I got here Monday morning at 7, I guess it was 10 after 7, the line was all the way up to Silver Lake and going around the lake. And so, wow. yeah, it was crazy. Security said people were here in RVs with generators and they were going to pop a squat uh, until they could get in line. And, I mean, there was a lot of people here. It was really surprising. Yeah, Claremont, it's at the Claremont Arts Center. Yeah, they, they said they were having it. trouble finding spaces large enough. I know in Orlando, they're using the conference center. That's what Peggy Nunes was saying yesterday. So, or maybe it was the day before yesterday. She was mentioning that they were going, they had to go all the way to the conference center for, for vaccination. It'd be nice if they could just distribute them to doctors and to like CVS and Walgreens and then people yeah. could, you know, spread it out instead of having it all in one place. Yeah, I, I think that would be yeah. easier. Well, the problem with that, of course, is the need to keep some of that stuff at really cold temperatures yeah and exactly you're cold talking stuff. 70 below celsius mm -hmm. you know not yeah, many people my, can handle it yeah my doctor said that they couldn't do that with private practices because this was not officially approved yet uh, so it's by emergency so uh, what they need to do is just go ahead and officially approve it since they're giving it to everybody i mean yeah. it's kind of stupid to have it be provisional. Definitely. West Florida is known for its extreme organization. <laughs> well, I heard the big problem nationwide, though, is that the federal government kind of dumped this on local governments and said, here's the vaccine, go, go crazy. And that, the, you know, the local governments are already overworked and underfunded. Wow. Once again, states' rights. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> just like the civil war yeah. uh, we'll see what happens hopefully yeah. hopefully things will start to look up in a few months it'd be nice to be back in august the way things yeah. are going i'm starting to worry about that well they keep yeah. pushing it back to november I, they just said this morning that that they will likely not get everybody vaccinated until the end of october or november which means we can't really get back to normal till the beginning of 2022. Yep. Or a new kind of normal. My cats are going to be so spoiled. Uh, <laughs> I've got a new, I got a new puppy last uh, March and he doesn't realize that I don't live here full time. So, <laughs> so if I just go to the grocery store, it's, 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 a uh, you know, it's an absolute um, crisis for him. So, <laughs> no, my cat's that way. If I go to the grocery store, she has to come and sit on my lap for an hour yeah. after I come back. And I do apologize if she comes up while I'm talking today because she might. Oh, he's standing right here next to me, wants to know why I'm not petting him. So, you know. <laughs> I'm always a fan of pets interrupting Zoom meetings. So, you're not going to get a complaint out of me, Kristen. Yeah. Uh, I every, will probably time, laugh. every time I start to talk, she thinks I'm talking to her. So <laughs> don't be surprised if she makes a special guest appearance, but she doesn't know that much about MLA. So, well, that's okay. It's we'll not give her a pass. <laughs> Princess is curled up snow snoring on her bed right next to my feet. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Aww. She's all settled into the new house. She's like, all right. Every time I leave, she looks at me like, really? Oh, did you move? <laughs> <laughs> but she likes it did you well, just get moved yeah um i signed on the house on the 17th got my keys on the 18th got my stuff on the 19th slept awesome. in it on the 26th nothing like moving during a pandemic Thank you. <laughs> it is kind of awesome 
Yeah, I moved in May when it it was like at the height of the lockdown, and that was not fun. Oh, that yeah, was not a no. fun experience. No, everybody wants to charge you a COVID surcharge. Mm, I didn't get that. Maybe they hadn't thought of that yet. <laughs> yeah, I I was calling around for uh, different companies to move me out of my storage unit because oh. all my stuff's been there for nine months, and I was like, "There's like, okay, well, this is the base price." And then we have the COVID charge. I'm like, what's the COVID charge? Well, our movers have to, um, they have to sanitize themselves in the truck and then they have to move all your stuff in and then they have to move all your stuff out and then they have to sanitize themselves in the truck again. And I'm like, it's boxes, people that have been it's sitting in storage for nine months. I have not gone near them. <laughs> well, my thing is, did they not sanitize the trucks before? I know. <laughs> That's worrying. Yeah, I got a couple friends to move me. I'm like, this is capitalism at its best. Yeah. (laughs) Bernie Sanders is going to be in charge of the budget now. This is good. This makes me exciting. Mm. I'm still waiting on the AG appointment. That's going to excite me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, all right, guys, it's 1045. So uh, yep. we should probably get rolling on this session since when we timed it out yesterday, Kristen and I were coming in real close to the to the cap. We have a lot we want to talk about and we want to hear from you guys as well uh, as we get there. So uh, let me start by saying hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Arms. I'm an assistant librarian and uh, English instructor and adjunct uh, at Lake Central State College. Uh, I've been a librarian for the past 10 years and I really do enjoy teaching citations to students and faculty. And honestly, in my opinion, we can all use a refresher every now and again as to what they consider to be current style. Um, Many of us probably haven't looked too closely at MLA in the last few years, but we all count it as a course requirement for our students. So really our goal today is to kind of provide you with a review of all the major elements of MLA so that you feel more comfortable uh, and prepared to work with it and students in your own classroom. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Ms. Kristen Chancy, and she can, is going to give herself an introduction to you guys. Hi, guys. I'm Kristen. For those of you who don't know me, I have been working with MLA since 1986 when I did my first research paper in junior high school. And I've been teaching MLA since 1997, and I've been teaching MLA online since 2010. So like many of you, I have a really long history with MLA, and I'm sort of notoriously picky about MLA. And that's for two reasons. First of all, MLA is so important to as an aspect of information literacy to help avoid plagiarism and get students used to, you know, citing their information properly. Also, I think it creates really attractive and readable papers, and it really helps students to learn to understand the importance of editing, because in an age of texting, many of our students are coming in and just thinking, you know, anything goes. And if there's one thing Emily teaches them is that anything does not go. Alrighty, so what I want to do first today is just do a review of basic page format, which a lot of you guys are probably really familiar with, but there are always little wrinkles and I'm learning things about MLA format all the time. So for many of you, this will be a happy review of stuff you already know, but you may learn a few things that you weren't aware of before. So let me get a word file open and share my screen. Very important. Hold on. Let me get this situated. Everybody see my document? Okay, awesome. All right, so here's a lovely blank Word file that is about to be a lovely MLA style style file. Now, one cool thing, of course, about Word is that its default margins are one inch, which is pretty much how MLA wants them. So you don't have to worry about margins. So the easiest thing to start with is name. So of course, in the upper left-hand corner, we're gonna have a four line header with the student's name. And then we are going to have uh, the professor's name. Now, different professors want different things. I like my students to put Professor Chansey. Uh, Some people like to put like Ms. Chansey or Dr. Smith or whatever. But so you should really let your students know what you want them to call you. Next comes the course number. Uh, I like the plain course number, so in this case, CNC 1101. Some people will prefer the name of the class. Again, you should let your students know what you prefer. And then we come to the date. Now, when it comes to wrinkles, this is one that I learned just a few semesters ago. 
Um, generally in MLA, as we all know, dates are reversed. So it's not January 6, 2021, it's 6th of January, 2021. But we do also know that dates in the citations are shortened. So any month that's shorter or longer than four letters, so any month except for May, June, or July, gets shortened to three letters and a period. So it wouldn't be January, it'd be J-A-N period. But that's not how it's supposed to be in the header. In the header, you write the month out. So um, if that's something you didn't know, like I didn't know up until a few semesters ago, it is something to keep in mind. All right. Come down to the next line and type the title of the assignment. Now, the title of the assignment, like titles in general in MLA format, uses what's known as title case, where you capitalize the first letter of all the major words, the nouns, the adjectives, the verbs, but the little connecting words like prepositions such as of or articles such as the don't get capitalized. Sometimes it can be difficult for students to remember exactly what they're supposed to capitalize and what they're not supposed to capitalize. So what I do is point my students towards this really cool website. Let me get uh, websites up. Can you guys see that? Can you guys see the website? Okay, yeah. it's called capitalizemytitle.com. And what's cool about capitalizemytitle.com is all they have to do is type in the box um, and make sure that they've got the right tabs up. So if you wanted to do an MLA title case title, click MLA, click title case, and then they can just type. I am not putting in these capital letters. Capitalizemytitle.com is putting in these capital letters, which is pretty cool. Um, it does sometimes not recognize proper nouns. So you do need to warn them about that. But in general, it's a really good tool to give them if they're having trouble remembering how to capitalize things. And like I said, the website is just capitalizemytitle.com. And I've used this with students for several semesters and they do use it and they do like it. I think it makes them feel like they've got something uh, supporting them when it comes to this kind of stuff. Alrighty, so let me go back to my document, switch my share back again. Okay, so now you come down to the next line and you hit tab because the first line of every paragraph in the body is uh, indented a tab and this is the first line of the assignment. Now obviously we're not finished because we have our nice raw information, but we haven't done all of the formatting yet. First thing to do, of course, is to center that title because your paper title is centered and you can center that up here. Um, under the justification buttons, or you can just click control E and that will center your title. We also have to think about font. Now, MLA is, is pretty kind to people when it comes to font. It needs to be a standard readable font, 12 point in size. This is Calibri 11, which is the word default font. So I'm a Times New Roman girl, have been for most of my life. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in Times New Roman. Now you can highlight everything by using your cursor or by hitting the hotkeys control A. Uh, now, you can change the font up here, but what I like to do is go here to where it says font and pull open this little arrow. And under here where it says font body, I just type in times and it brings up Times New Roman and tell it I want 12. The reason I bother to do this is down here it says set as default. You can set your font as the default font for the entire document, headers, everything. So if you want to keep it from snapping back to Calibri 11, which it will sometimes, um, you can set it for this document. You can set it for every document in Word, but for today, we're just gonna do this document. Okay, so now we have our font the way we want it. Uh, the other thing we need to do is work on our spacing. So either use your cursor to highlight or hit Control A again. And you can fix the line spacing up here because Word wants everything double spaced. Um, you can use, you can hit 2.0 and then hit remove space after paragraph and it'll give you what you need. But again, I like to open up the paragraph box, which you do by clicking this arrow. 
because you can just kind of see what's going on a little bit better. One of the quirks of Word is that every time you hit the return key, it wants to put in an extra eight points of space, which doesn't work with MLA style spacing. So over here under spacing before and after, I take it down to zero. And then under line spacing, I hit it as double. And then I also set this as my default spacing for this document. And that way, everything's going to stay double spaced. And now we have our font. We have everything in place, except, of course, for our page number. So to get page numbers into Word, there's a couple different ways to do it. But I find this is the easiest way. And this way, Word doesn't fight you. Take your cursor up here and double click. All right. And at the top, this new uh, ribbon will open. And under here where it says page number, tell it you want one at the top of the page and go down to plane number three. And then just type the last name in a space in front of it. And you have a beautifully put together MLA document. Now, one thing I do want to tell you guys about is not every student uses the word that they download to their computer. Some students like to use word online. So uh, one thing that's cool if you have students that like to use Word Online is, let me switch my share and go over here to the Online Word. Online Word has these templates at the top of the page. Now, I'm afraid that the APA template is not um, yet updated to the new APA. So if you teach APA, you probably don't want to tell your students to use the APA template until Word gets around to updating it. But the MLA template is in really good shape. And again, if students aren't feeling confident, but they like to use Word, this will show them where the elements should go. Uh, everything in the four line header, the title, and usually there's a little tab at the top that shows where the page number header should be. Sometimes that thing takes a while to pop up. Weirdly enough, when I'm not doing Zoom, it always pops up immediately. But as soon as I have to show people, the header tab for the page numbers doesn't pop up. But it is another option. Um, I came up with this when I noticed how many of my students do like to use Word Online. So it's definitely a way that you can go. Alrighty. So with that in mind, now that we kind of have gone over how to set up a document, um, it's really important to start talking about MLA citation, because of course MLA isn't just about putting the page uh, in a certain format, it's also about documenting those sources correctly. So what I want to do is take you guys over to the Lake Sumter homepage. Now, if you guys were in Andy's session last time, you've already seen how to get to our library homepage, but I wanted to show everybody again. So this is lssc.edu over here under Lake Hawk links. Go down here to library and learning centers. And this takes you to our beautiful library homepage. But what we're really concerned with today is the blue citation button. So let's go over there. Alrighty. Now, our Citation Center is a comprehensive resource that is the result of hundreds of hours of work on the part of our fantastic librarians. And it is such an amazing resource. I use it constantly. I know our librarians use it constantly um, because there's just so much good stuff here. So, um, we have handouts that you can download and give to your students, print them out, just give the students the web address um, of, we have all kinds of handouts for MLA, for APA, and for other citation styles like Chicago or CSE. We also have a portion of the LibGuide devoted to each of the three major citation styles students are likely to encounter in college. We also have sections on avoiding plagiarism, bringing up an annotated bibliography. There's just so much stuff that's useful here. But what I'm going to concentrate on today is our MLA styles section. Okay, so the first thing you're going to see besides the link to how you can get the handbook is a section on basic citation elements. Uh, which is fantastic. But to me, the most useful part of this is the grid. So when MLA 8 came out about four years ago, one of its purposes was to really update MLA for the 21st century. 
um, as we all know, citation was really thrown for a loop when digital sources came in in such a major way uh, in the early, uh, the early part of the century. And so what they wanted was something that was flexible and future proof. So you could cite just about anything and this citation format would become, um, would be relevant for a long time to come. So what they did was they came up with the idea of containers. So you have a source, you know its title, you know who wrote it usually. Um, and then you got to think about where was this source contained? And was there just one container or were there multiple containers? And this grid that we have for the MLA core elements really shows you how the container uh, idea really works. So this is an article by Greg Gerard called Solar Apocalypse Not. So of course the first thing in our grid, which is also the first thing in our citation, is the author's name. And it's always last name comma first name, followed by a period, because this is an element unto itself. Then we have the title of the source. Uh, now notice this goes in quotation marks, small sources in MLA go into quote marks, things like articles, uh, short poems, individual TV episodes, individual songs. The titles do use title case though, so students need to capitalize all those major words. And that is an element unto itself, so it's followed by a period. After that, we get the first container. So where was the source originally found? Well, it was in a book called Ian McEwen, Contemporary Critical Perspectives. And this is a book title. A book is considered a large source. Uh, so books, entire newspapers, entire magazines, entire television shows or movies, their titles go in italics, but they still use title case. Now, all of the other parts of this part of the grid is really supporting information about the container. Now, you're not always gonna have every single element that's in the grid. And that's part of MLA's flexibility, that if you don't have something, you can simply skip it, either because the source didn't tell you about it or because it doesn't exist for that particular source. So here we do have an editor. This book was edited by Sebastian Gross, and it's in a second edition. Not every book will be in multiple editions, so often this won't be present. It does not have a number. It does have a publisher, Bloomsbury Academic. Now, this is one thing that the new, new MLA is doing, is really trying to bring home to people that some of these elements are very flexible. So we tend to think of publisher as a publishing company. But really, the whole purpose here is to really tell the reader who sort of presented this information. So if this were a stage play, it would be the theater company that put on the play. If it were a podcast, it would be the platform for the podcast, you know, the host for the podcast. So you can be, again, a bit flexible with these categories and kind of think outside the box with them. And Kevin's going to talk more about that when we get to his portion of the presentation. After that, we have a publication date and then the location, uh, which is the page numbers of the article. So all of these are considered part of the container element of the citation. So notice that they're held together with commas. And we know this container section is ended because it ends in a period. Now, if this were a physical source, you went into the library and picked this book off the shelf and found the article then we would be done. It would be a one container source. But of course, we live in the digital age where students many times are never going to open a physical book to do a paper. And in that case, we actually have a second container that contains the first container. And that is the library database where this, um, this book was found, which is EBSCO eBook Collection. A database is a big thing, so it's put in italics. We don't have any of these other things that are in the grid. And that's fine. Again, you don't have that information, it's not relevant to that publication, you skip that part and you go to what is relevant, which is the location, which is the permalink for this particular source. And we'll talk about permalinks in a bit. Now, at the end, now you finish the second container section, but at this point, um, we also have something that Lake Sumter chooses to do. Not every uh, 
entity will do this. I've even seen some MLA books and other things that don't include this, but we do include this for all of our web sources. This is a decision Lake Sumter made, and this is an access date. So at the very end of our digital citations, we put the word accessed and then the date that this source was accessed. And notice because this is part of a citation, this is a shortened date. It's not April, it's APR period. Now we decided to do this because access dates we felt are important. I think it's an important variation of MLA because sometimes web sources do change. Maybe not something in a database quite so much, but certainly websites can change on a daily basis. So we felt it was important to include the access date. So now that we've filled in the grid, we have all of our information in the right order, in the right format. And here is what the finalized citation would look like. Author's name, last name, last name comma, first name, followed by a period. <laughs> Sorry. Special guest star, my cat. Um, the name of the article, in quote marks, the name of the, uh, the first container, which is the book and all its accompanying information, and then the second container, which is, of course, the ebook collection, and then uh, the date of the source. Now, if you like the grid system and you would like to use it for your, for your students or for your own purposes, we have a really cool um, download that you can use um, that has the grid on it. We also have some other really good stuff for MLA, including all of these uh, handouts, the sample paper, uh, annotated bibliographies, outline templates that, of course, your students can use. But what I want to really concentrate on now is to show you just our citation examples. And these are so cool. Uh, our librarians have put together templates for just about any kind of common source a student could use, and then also a number of samples. So um, we have these for books, magazines, newspapers, and journals. Uh, we have them for websites. We have them for special sources like the Bible or Shakespeare. And then we have a lot of media sources. And in particular, we have a very good handout on how to do MLA images. So if you have, give your students um, some kind of paper or project where they need to use images, you can just show them this handout, print it out for them, give them whatever they need to have. What I wanna show you guys is a couple of samples. Uh, of course, there's no time to, to show all of this. And of course, we don't need to. This is the beauty of having the LibGuide is if you don't remember how to cite you know, a print journal, you can always come here and look it up at any time. Like I said, I use this all the time. What I want to show you guys, though, is a sample journal because students use journals a lot in their college work. And also journal citations are very similar to magazine and newspaper citations. Now notice for each of these sources, we have the different types, such as a print version, a database version, and a website version. But let's look at the database version. So this is by Michael McCarthy. Now, McCarthy, comma Michael's name is followed by an abbreviation called et al, which is Latin, that means and others. So we know from this that Michael McCarthy um, had more than one fellow author. If it had been Michael McCarthy and Joe Green, we would put Joe Green's name. But because there's et al, we know that there were at least two other additional authors. Maybe there were five or six. It is a journal article, but we don't have to write them all. So we have his name. We have the name, the name of the source, uh, and it's a long article. It's a journal article with a long title. And then we have our first container, which is the journal, Health and Social Work, that originally contained this. And then we have the second container, which is a nursing a database and the permalink. And then, of course, we have the access date. So again, we can see all elements of the grid right here. Now, the one thing you do want to tell your students is to make sure that they use the permalink when they are giving the links for their sources. So many times, I'll show you here, this is the actual home, the page where we found the journal article in the databases. Students will want to go up here and use this browser link, but this browser link isn't going to work. Uh, more than once. Um, it's going to change depending on when you bring up this article. So you want to always bring students over here to the permalink. And when they bring up the permalink, that's going to be something they can always find. I don't know why. Can you guys see the permalink box? It's not coming up for me. Usually it does come up. 
The second thing you can show them are the sample citations. Hold on, let me reload this page. Oh, a problem occurred, okay. Well, never mind. Um, also, just do be aware that every database has sample citations, which you can usually access. However, those sample citations are often only about 85% correct. So they'll give students a good place to start, but they will not necessarily give them the entirely correct citation. So you should always warn them to check those sample citations against things like the LibGuide. Okay. I'm rapidly running out of time, but luckily I'm almost finished. So. The other thing I wanted to show you guys is our websites. So students use a lot of websites and websites are generally easy because they're usually one container sources. You just have the article and the website that contained it. Um, but often you won't have an author, uh, like in this example, Guide to Spain. It doesn't tell us who wrote the Guide to Spain, but that's okay because um, we don't necessarily need to know the author if it's a credible website. And we just skip the author name and go directly to the title guide to Spain. Now also keep in mind that you will need to give the web address that's part of the container, but note that MLA uh, does not want the HTTP part of the web address. That's something MLA doesn't like. Also MLA does not want permalinks uh, because uh, they don't want those blue, I mean they do want permalinks, but they don't want those blue active links. So if you have students putting in blue active links into their citations, tell them to right click on those citations and deactivate them. All right, guys. So last thing I need to tell you is about how to put these cita the citation information into a Works Cited page. So I'm going to switch my screen again and go back to my Word document. Okay, so one of the things I'll often advise students to do when they're having to make up their um, Works Cited page is to first when they start the work cited, we're going to assume that this is actually a fully developed paper rather than one that's only one sentence long, is to go up here to the insert tab and put in a page break. This will make sure that the work cited does not float into the rest of the paper because the work cited is supposed to be the last page and on a separate page. And then we just have to type the title, which is work cited. Notice that it is it is a plural works because generally you're citing multiple works. It's only called a work if there's one work and that it's both letter, both words are capitalized and that the second word is spelled C-I-T-E-D. It's amazing how often that gets misspelled. Okay, once we have the title, we're ready to start putting in our citations. Now, I'll often tell students to just put the bold template from the LibGuide into their Works Cited and start filling it in. That's a good way to get them sort of into their Works Cited pages. Um, they have to unbold everything, of course, but otherwise they can just fill it in bit by bit and it makes the whole thing way less stressful. What I'm going to do to show you the last couple things is just use some sample citations that I took right out of the LibGuide. Okay. So these were the sources that I showed you guys. So they're in good shape in terms of information and in terms of citation format, but there's still a couple of things we need to do on this page to make them actually MLA format. First thing we need to do is put them in alphabetical order. So that means that Michael, McCarth or Michael McCarthy's source is going to go at the end. You alphabetize by the first author's last name or by the title if you don't have an author. The last thing you need to do is to distinguish between the individual citations. Now, sometimes students will try to use uh, extra space between citations or bullet points or numbers. None of these things are MLA format. All they have to do is use a hanging indent. And to set a hanging indent, you just highlight everything, go back up to that paragraph box, and go over to where it says indentation right here and special. Pull that down and you'll see hanging as a choice. And what this does is it doesn't indent the first line, but it indents all additional lines. And that way it's easy to see the difference between the different citations. And now we have a beautifully put together in, uh, in format works cited page that students um, can 
definitely use as a template. And we are going to give you guys this stuff as a template before the session is over. Now, of course, these aren't the only citations that appear in an MLA style paper. You also need to cite sources in the body of the paper as well as at the end. But I'm going to put you into Kevin's capable hands to tell you guys all about in-text citations. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. So now that we know how to set up our guide, um, <clears throat> our works cited page, and we understand the basic elements that go into those particular citations, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about what in-text or parenthetical citations are. So MLA does require two types of citations for its style. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, a works cited entry and a parenthetical citation to reference the content within the body of the paper. Setting up in-text citations is actually really, really easy once you have the works cited page. And I often want to tell students, you should start with the works cited page and work backwards to your in-text citations. The information you need for the in-text citation comes from that works cited page anyway. So let me open up a document here real quick. And then through the magic of television, I actually have the same document that Kristen was just working with. <laughs> and so as you can see here, here are our works cited entries that we just discussed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the next page where we have some additional information where I can talk about those sample in-text citations. So there really are a couple of types. You either have one that has an author's name or you have a type that doesn't have an author's name. Uh, in my opinion, the, the non-author name is always a little bit more tricky for students to figure out how to properly use in-text. Uh, so I'm gonna show you both a parenthetical and something called a signal phrase, which is how you uh, introduce the article or the work in the body of your paper and you're able to change out how you're doing your in-text citation. Uh, so let's start with uh, one that we know. So we have Guide to Spain, Etiquette, Customs, Culture, and Business. That's our uh, article from the previous page. So if we're going to do a parenthetical, we only have the information of the title. You're either going to have a title or an author, but sometimes you're not going to have an author at all, and we're only going to have a title to work with. Here, we don't only have a title to work with. So when we go to do our in-text citation, that's what's going to go in the parentheses. As you can see here, Guide to Spain, and we truncated that because the title is actually much longer than that. It's actually Guide to Spain, Etiquette, Customs, Culture, and Business. But you don't need all of that information in the body of your paper. You can actually just use the first part of the title. Technically, everything after the semicolon is a subtitle anyway. So we truncated here to just Guide to Spain. Uh, if you're going to use a signal phrase, hang on, I'm seeing some stuff popping up here. Oh, yes, I am going to talk about MLA 9 as I get towards the end there. I do see that comment popping up. So, okay. Um, so, and then if we're going to do a signal phrase, really, because we don't have a page number and we don't have an author, you just flat out say <laughs> the article, Guide to Spain, explains that Spanish is the first language of over 72% of the population. Very simple to do. The next one is a traditional author. Uh, we have Helms. So, if we were to do a parenthetical citation for Helms, it's simply... Here's our quotation. One critic states, Whitman valued the poems of Live Oak enough to include all of them among the 45 poems of Calamus. So then we see our parenthetical citation, Helms. We don't have a page number for Helms, therefore we don't need to include it, but we do have the author's name here. So we're going to use the author instead of the title. The last one is one with multiple authors. So this is the McCarthy et al, which again, as Kristen mentioned, et al stands for et alia or and others. Uh, so that tells us right away that there's at least two additional authors, probably more if it's a journal, as Kristen mentioned. Parenthetically, because this citation does actually have page numbers, and we can see that in the citation itself. Uh, so we see here, uh, Michael McCar uh, McCarthy, Michael et alia. Uh, here is our title. And so here we see page numbers. 139 through 148 is where it originally appeared in the, um, the journal. And so we have to use a page number for a direct quote if we have it. Uh, so here it says McCarthy et al, 144. This is where this particular uh, information came from. Signal phrase would work almost the same way. McCarthy et al, assert that, and then you provide the information for your direct quote, and you follow it with the page number in parenthetical citation. Does that make sense for everybody? Good, 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 good. Okay. So I want to remind you that the in-text or parenthetical citation should be placed as close to the information that you're referencing as possible. 
Um, this means right after a direct quotation or right at the end of any information that's being uh, paraphrased or summarized. Uh, this is definitely something that students struggle with and they need additional support in papers in my personal experience. They tend to produce an entire paragraph and at the very bottom of that paragraph, they will put their in-text citation. And that leads to the question, which information in this is actually being cited? Uh, so it's really important for those citations to live as close to the parenthetical information that you're using as possible. Um, one question that always comes up, um, and I've had this come up in a few different classes over the last several years, is whether or not certain types of information requires a citation. So these things are typically called common knowledge citations, and they're classified as things that everyone knows, and I put everyone in quotes for a reason, uh, like the years World War I or World War II or the Civil Wars dates, uh, along with other major historical information. The problem with common knowledge citations, though, is that they change along with generational shifts. So I have a background in anthropology, and we've had lots of discussions about what the word common means and to whom are we referring when we say common knowledge. So what we may have learned in school uh, many years ago that was considered common knowledge, that may have shifted in the last five or six years. And so students may not actually know some of the information that we would personally consider to be common knowledge. Uh, so my advice in those scenarios is cite it anyway. Um, you can't go wrong with having an extra citation. Uh, my suggestion there though, is that there's no harm in citing it. Just make sure that you're using a quality authoritative source like a primary source document or a, a scholarly secondary source item. Um, just like you would for any other elements of your paper, you should probably just get in the habit of citing everything regardless of whether or not it's considered common knowledge. There's a lot of arguments that could be made about what that actually is. Kevin, could you make the, I'm so sorry, could you make yeah, the document yeah. a little bit bigger? A few folks wanted to see things in a bigger format. Sure. Sorry to break in. No, 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 you're fine. Let me see if I can zoom my screen in just a little bit here. Uh, you got that, yeah, there you go. Is that a little bit better? That's a little slightly larger. I can go a little bit larger. There we go, yeah. So for the last portion of our discussion, um, I kind of wanted to talk about some resources that are available for, for everybody to use. And Kristen had already discussed our really beautiful uh, library guide for citation that the college has put together, the college librarians have put together. But I did also want to mention that there's another source that we sometimes use uh, when we have really tricky MLA questions. And a couple of people have messaged me privately in the chat and mentioned that they have had to do this in the past. So one of the websites that I wanted to show you, um, let me quickly open it here. So the website that I would like to point out to you is the MLA Style Center. So this is the official source of all things MLA. Uh, and when we get those really complicated questions about certain types of literary citations, many of the times they're not gonna be things that we encounter regularly. So they're probably not gonna be in the standard citation guides. And I know there've been a couple of instances where I've had to actually email the MLA staff and ask a question about style. So they have this section called Ask of the MLA. And if you take a quick look at it, they generally cover the material um, that comes up from those really unusual types of questions. Uh, so they have questions about works cited lists and about using sources and writing tips and in-text citations and how punctuation works and, and in certain, like when do you double punctuate something? Um, when does it get a, an italic over a quote? Uh, just those random unusual questions that we sometimes encounter even the librarians refer back to the MLA style blog for a lot of our, our complex questions. So this is always a, a resource that I think is useful, especially if you can't find the answer you're looking for, try the MLA style blog. Um, there's a very good chance someone's asked that question and you, you'll find an answer here instead. And so let me put that in the chat box. This is style.mla.org. Uh, Okay, so for the last little bit that I'm going to be talking, I kind of wanted to talk about some of the changes that are coming up for MLA uh, ninth edition. And I know a lot of us, when we heard that they were going to produce another edition, we all groaned and just felt 
terrified by this idea because we remember what the change was like going from seven to eight and how they had made such substantial differences in, in the way that they do things. So the good news is largely the information that's coming for MLA-9, and let me pull this up here for you guys. The information that's coming out for MLA-9 major changes have nothing to do with direct style. Um, most of the content that they are updating and or changing reflects uh, handbook changes themselves and not actual style adjustments per se. So what they're planning to focus on when they come out with the MLA 9th edition in April, and this is the most recent information that I could find on the MLA 9 transition. I checked it last night. Um, they're looking to clarify element names. As Kristen mentioned earlier, um, we often tend to read those uh, container modules as static, like literal things. So publisher is a publishing company. But what they're planning to do is expand the idea that those terms aren't necessarily literal. Uh, and so a theater company could actually be a publisher if they have produced a play, or a podcast producer can be a publisher if they have produced content. Um, so the, the terms are not quite as literal as we may have been accustomed to treating them. Um, so there's gonna be new guidance on how to interpret some of those elements uh, in the new style book. They are adding new explanations of in-text citation with signal phrases, and they are adding more inclusive language. You might realize that APA 7th edition recently did this, transitioning away from the, the use of he, she, him, or hers to uh, theirs or them. Uh, and so that is a change that MLA is planning to adapt as well. And then there's also gonna be a new appendix, including hundreds of samples of works cited list entries that are gonna be available for students to take a look at. And it'll feature things like YouTube citations and podcasts and songs and all of those unusual and sometimes tricky things to cite. Um, they're going to provide an additional layer of content for that. So that is the current information that I have on the upcoming MLA 9th edition changes. So I think we can all breathe a, at least a, a general sigh of relief that it's not going to be a giant style overhaul that we all have to relearn. Uh, it largely appears to be handbook and support material based for this particular change. So that's at least something to be grateful for. Uh, so at this point, I think Kristen, uh, we have reached the end of our content. So we would love to uh, open up the floor for discussion. If you have any questions or comments that you would like us to address, um, you can type them in the chat box uh, or you can, if you feel so inclined, you may unmute your microphone and ask directly. Oh, and Kevin, I just sent you the updated version of our template with the date issue with McCarthy fixed. Ah, beautiful. If you want to share that with folks, I would share it, but it's for some reason my computer's not letting me share files over Zoom. Yeah, here is that file, and I just loaded it to the chat box for everybody. Um, I fixed the McCarthy citation in LibGuide as well. Thank you, Nora. We appreciate as that. As we were sitting there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, we had a great discussion about the date thing, the the, the header date, because I'd always thought that the every date is abbreviated in MLA. Mm -hmm. And then I was told, no, you write it out in the header. But now apparently Anna says that uh, the MLA folks themselves said you can do it either way. So please disregard that part of my presentation. Apparently header dates are how, how you want to do it. I was going to say with a um, lot of those things in that header, I think sometimes it comes down to instructor preference. Um, and so honestly, I would go either way there as an instructor, but it, either way, it's five and there's six in one hand, half dozen in the other for me. What Anna and I found was that the MLA style website said one thing and the handbook said a different thing. Interesting. So Anna emailed them <laughs> because we're like, which one's right? What are you people doing? <laughs> right. So, Sometimes um, we have to ask them. Yeah. They did that. Yeah. They, um, they told her either one works. So. Only on the first page element, though, guys. That's it, right? Only on the the header element, right? Yeah. So in the in the paper, if you write it, it has to be spelled out in the paper, and at the end of the on the work side, it, it can be abbreviated. If it has to be abbreviated, if it's more than four letters. That's so what I'm talk, talk about confusion on the date, but on the month, but yeah. It, There's it, also it, a minor one in September, uh, as I recall. I think it's the only one that gets a four letter abbreviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. SEPT period, as opposed so if, to- If they change that in the new version, yoo-hoo! Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Talking about confusion. 
yeah and find it in different places i literally had to email them i'm like what but it yeah, is cool that that mla style blog will let you ask some questions mm -hmm. and we've done this before i mean i know there's been yeah. times that we've tried to solve a problem in a citation and we've had to actually go to the experts themselves and ask modern language how how is this work because we're confused by as nora mentioned sometimes it says one thing in the handbook and then the blog will give other guidance and so it's it can be a bit confusing yeah, they, they told me they're going to take down the blog. Are they really? That's yeah. what they said. It was an old, it was an old um, uh, entry in the blog, and they said they would change it and take down that section of the blog. Okay. Like, yes, so you don't confuse everybody else. That's good. No, that's very good. <laughs> they probably just, it was probably just one of those things where they accidentally missed it. Yeah, it was one. an old one, and they did probably just slip through the crack. So. Yeah, most likely. So that's, that's good to know. Awesome. No this might be a weird question. Uh, I once, um, I've got a citation book in my office that lists all the styles I do it, but I once had a student write a paper and listed me as something I said in class and quoted, <laughs> and I didn't know exactly how that was cited, how that should there be There is cited. actually a format for that. I know uh, there is, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So I think... Nora, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Is do we have an aversion of that on the citation guide? Oh, I believe. Um, I think there is an example of a of that in the lib guide, but I'm not positive. Um, Graham, were you interested in APA or MLA? MLA. Uh, either one's fine. I mean, I've got a, I've got a big thick book and it gives me all the, it gives me examples of how to use all the different reference styles and stuff and how to do it. But I couldn't remember, I couldn't find one that have that showed that. I think that's one that I actually had to look with, look up with the MLA style blog because I had to do it for another class of my own. Yeah, I, yes, let's just look under MLA. That'd be fine. I know MLA has <laughs> a style, but I don't know that we have an example for it. Um, let me look that up real fast. Someone in chat oh, said sorry. personal conversation with name date. That's certainly possible. Yes, that is possible. Um, I know. Yeah. And as someone said in APA, it's personal communication. Um, yeah. Perscom. Actually, I think APA has a lecture note citation now. I think they do as well. Yeah. I believe I saw that in the APA seventh edition change. What I'm hoping for in the MLA edition change is that they're going to clarify a lot of the, with examples, a lot of the oblique things that, I like so. this, you know, like, <laughs> give some me of it, as you said, is oblique. Yeah, there's definitely some confusion there, especially in practice. Yes, it will be. It'll be excellent to have new examples. I agree, Jeremy. That's why I was asking, because I've got a book when I looked at the examples didn't seem to be quite clear. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably one of those weird ones that, let me see. Um, but I remember this once before, because I'm like you, I remember I, I was like a, a, a um, pr uh, what was it, a presentation I went to see a guest speaker or something, and I had to use something from them, and I remember quoting it in a paper, and I forgot how the citation, how I had to do the citation. Yeah, I'm looking to see if I can find it on the style blog. <laughs> so yeah, so there MLA is handbook, kind of a format for this. So the MLA handbook says a lecture or other address heard in person may be indicated as such. Like you can cite it as a, so for example, the example they give here is a speech by Margaret Atwood at the MLA annual convention. So um, they gave the author as Margaret Atwood, the title of the speech, um, the title of the convention, and then the MLA annual convention, the date of that, where, and then at the end it says address. Um, let me see if there's anything more specific.
Yeah, they're giving it as venue, city, and date. One of the things you can do, um, I've told students before, that you can list the instructor as your author mm -hmm. with the maybe the topic they were covering that day. Um, and then, I don't know, um, the, the name of the class and the name of the college and the date of the class or something uh, like that. Michelle from e, uh, EFSC posted in that the style blog has a uh, citing an online lecture speech uh, citation format on their blog. And it looks like it's just author, title, location, publication, and then where you saw it from. So it would be the same thing. If they were taking something out of Canvas, it would look probably pretty similar to a web-based um, citation using you as the author. We saw in the chat asking for a link to APA guidelines. Or, or did you mean MLA? I wasn't sure. Person in chat, Ortiz. Yeah, that's that's me, Dr. Ortiz. Dr. Ortiz, um, all of the APA. I know you guys have been talking. I know you guys been talking about MLA all morning, but I like APA a whole lot more. Oh yeah, love APA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a whole section on that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ortiz, in that guide that we were showing earlier. Uh, where Kristen was looking at the MLA stuff. There's also an entire section there on the current version of APA 7th edition. Okay, good. Thank you. Because I've been trying to drill that into the students and it is so hard to get these guys to go looking for this stuff. I totally understand. I even tell them where to and it's like, uh, we can't find it. <laughs> so Dr. Ortiz, I'll just, since we're talking about information literacy all day today, I will remind you. You can always ask for a librarian to come and talk with your classes if you would like us to do that. I, I, I used James once one time. I had him embedded in one of my classes and he worked. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to make use of us. We are happy to do wonderful. this. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I have that experience. It's really nice. It's good. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad it was a good experience. Yeah. And we also have APA handouts and templates too that, that you can link them to. or uh, So all of that's there. Okay, good. I will, I will go looking for them. I'm adding up to, to the silos or somewhere in the course so they can use them. Thank you. And Nora or Kevin, am I wrong that you guys can do a LibGuide for, for a class that has links to all of this? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can embed anything that's in our guides can be added to any other guide and, and mapped, you know, and we can adjust things to be personal to that class. I mean, that's part of the library intervention model ultimately is that we try to personalize our service as much as we can to the students and the instructor, you know, so that they get the best out of, out of the library system that they need. This is Mary Haken and they've done that for my business communications classes and it's great. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And those of you who aren't instructors at Lake Sumter, you can still link to our LibGuide. Please Absolutely. don't forget that it's an open source. Mm -hmm. It sure is. So these things are all available and, and, and Nora and others have put a lot of work into them and they're beautiful and they're the most helpful things. Uh, even in grad school, when I was working on my English degree, I was actually still using the Lake Sumter citation guides over my university's guides. I'll be completely honest. Yeah, and I'll look up things in front of my students in class because I think it's good. It's showing good practices that you nobody expects you to know this stuff off the top of your head because every time you get it memorized, they change it anyway. So it's good to get used to just looking it up. And the few times that we have little tiny errors, like with that date, you saw how quickly Nora fixed that. She always fixes stuff that quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's it's vetted as much as anything can be vetted for correctness. So Lena, yes, absolutely. If you're the only librarian and you don't have time to pull all that information together, there is no reason you can't, you know, borrow, borrow material from sister institutions. Um, and, and we're all very collaborative. And, it, you know, if you need help putting those things somewhere that you can reach them, just tell us. We can absolutely help you with that. All of the handouts that we've created are available to anyone. We, as a matter of fact, they don't have a CC by symbol right now on them. But I think I'm going to start doing that for most of them so that um, everybody understands that you can just use it. Yeah, um, we're big on Creative Commons licensing. So, well, awesome. Any other questions or comments for us? Beautiful. 
Well, okay. Thank you guys so much for coming today. We're so glad that you, you stuck it out with us. Uh, we know citation isn't the most interesting thing in the entire world, but it is a necessary evil for us. So <laughs> thanks so much for, for sitting in today. We appreciate you. Thanks very much, guys. We're having Thank lunch break now. So if you're coming for lunch, day, right? Yep, one o'clock. Awesome. Well, Bye. enjoy the rest of your conference day and hopefully we'll see you this afternoon. Bye-bye. job guys thank you hmm. i'm glad people are going to use a lip guide that's so cool i am too it's a great resource yeah some of our sister institutions are really small and and i'm sure that they have issues with you know trying to get that kind of info out to their students yeah you know? if you've only oh, got one wow. or two librarians that would be a lot to do for just one person it would it really would so that's exciting yeah, I'm happy. Anybody that wants to email and ask questions, I mean, we're happy to respond. Good chat, everything. I love how English teachers and librarians can talk about the vagaries of MLA for just hours on end. I know. <laughs> I wasn't too worried about that. I was like, I know we'll have some people ask some questions just because there's always some weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Always some weird stuff. Fun. All right, guys. So, are we good? Do we need to? I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. I will see you at the afternoon sessions. All right. Thank you. See you then. Bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, can we just end the meeting? It's telling me I need to assign a new host if I if I leave. Um... <laughs> Oh yeah, Katie, I think is the meeting host. For some reason it won't let me save the recording. If anybody has their button for recording. I don't have the ability to save it. I think if you stop the recording, it'll